Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of Crazy Money. This is your host, Paul Ollinger. How are you? I hope you're well. I'm good. I'm good. I'm hanging in there. Life is interesting, isn't it? We're going into this week three of the big Q, the quarantine, week three of homeschooling. It is no longer an experiment. It is no longer a novelty. It is now our current reality and the reality for our foreseeable future, at least for several weeks. And, you know, I was thinking the other day, I knew I was going to be responsible for raising my children. I just didn't know how much time it was going to take. I didn't know that they were going to need me around. (laughs) Interesting, isn't it? So I hope you're surviving among the uh, splendid, the social distancing. I was going to say splendid isolation, but that's not exactly what this is. That is a Warren Zevon song, which I highly encourage you to Google later. You've got the time after all. Warren Zevon, splendid isolation. I was talking about social distancing and thinking about it recently, six to eight feet, like being able to be in public, but have like a six foot eight boundary around yourself. That's not the worst thing in the world. You know, I mean, consider how painful it is to sit butt cheek to butt cheek with somebody in economy class, having six feet to yourself that we would consider that a luxury. And actually for people who are both claustrophobic and have a fear of abandonment, dude, six to eight feet, that's, that's your vibe right there. That's, this is your time, people who are both claustrophobic and have a fear of abandonment. I expect to see great things from you. So make the most of it, okay? Folks, I've got a great show for you today, a conversation with one of the funniest people on this here planet Earth. His name is Rory Scovel. He's an actor, writer, and comedian. And even if you don't know his name, you will recognize him. He's doing amazing things in the comedy world, and I can't wait to uh, share with you his perspective on what's going on in the world and how the way he grew up has influenced his career and his attitude towards money and gratitude and all those kinds of things that that are really important right now. Before I jump into my introduction of Rory, I want to say thank you to everyone for all the kind birthday wishes on Facebook this weekend. I turned 51. Yeah, that's a sexy birthday right there. I don't normally do this thing, but I took the opportunity this year to do a birthday fundraiser because I I, kind of, I'm feeling a little bit helpless, you know, not for myself, but to say like, okay, well, I want to help the broader world right now, but I'm not a microbiologist. And also I don't kind of want to leave my house. So I'm not going to be handing out meals on wheels. I'm just not going to be doing that right now. And I applaud the people who are, but I'm staying home like the order, but I did want to do something. And so I decided to do a a birthday fundraiser for the Atlanta community food bank, because this is a severe time for a lot of people. And those of us who are blessed with enough flexibility financially should be helping out. Now, look, I know we all have previous obligations. Stacy and I certainly do. The number one commitment for us is to keep those obligations and fill those obligations. But for right now, we wanted to make a special gift to the Atlanta Community Food Bank. And I'm excited that we raised, it'll be over five grand by the time it's done. Five grand from Facebook on the birthday fundraiser. So if you have, even if you have 20 bucks, if you have 20 bucks to give to your local food bank, I know they would appreciate it. Somebody out there, their customer, that's going to provide them food for a few days. So please take the opportunity to share that with those in your community. I've been asking myself, well, what else can I do to be a value in this time? And I've come up with, I think I can offer humor, insight, and perspective. I think that's what I've got to offer right now. And so we're going to take a tiny bit of a turn on what we're talking about on Crazy Money. And next week, I've got an interview with a guy who lost all his money to Bernie Madoff 12 years ago. He was very generous in sharing the trauma that imposed on his life. And I'm eager to share that with you because I think in this time when a lot of us have lost 30, 40% of our stock portfolios, we think it's the end of the world, yet we're never going to miss a meal. We're not going to have to contemplate suicide because we don't know how we're going to pay our rent in our old age. And Steve Heimoff is the guy's name. His story, I think, will be very, very interesting to you. The week after that, I have an interview with a woman who wrote a book called London Was Ours. And it's uh, a collection and an analysis of the diaries and the memoirs written by people who lived through the London Blitz. From September 1940 to May 1941, Hitler was dropping bombs all over London every single night or almost every single night. And I don't mean dropping bombs in the metaphorical hip hop way. I mean, bombs designed to kill men, women, and children to prepare for the inevitable 
German invasion of London. And not to say that what we're going through isn't severe right now. I just want to understand how people in other times have gotten through things that were unprecedented in their lives to that point. So that's what I'm thinking about. And that's what's coming up. I hope you'll take the time to check those out. Right now, I want to tell you about Rory Scovel. So comedians find it hard sometimes to watch other comics, but in preparation for this conversation, I was watching some of Rory's stuff on Conan and his most recent special, and it was past bedtime, and I felt a little tap on my shoulder, and my daughter said, why are you laughing so loud? And I realized in that moment that I had tears coming out of my eyes watching Rory stand up because it is so fresh and different and smart and crazy all at the same time. It is just this incredible blend of attributes that comes together in just sublime comedy. Roy Scovel has been on uh, Conan nine times in the last 10 years. He's been on Comedy Central several times. You might know him as the male lead in Amy Schumer's hit movie, I Feel Pretty. He was also a principal character in Dimitri Martin's 2016 film, Dean. He's appeared on many TV shows, including TBS's Ground Floor, True TV's Those Who Can't, NBC's Undateable and ABC's Modern Family. He's also a writer for The Eric Andre Show. Rory and I talk about him growing up in Greenville, South Carolina, his family, and how his family background affects his attitude toward money and his career. One thing I want to mention is that in reference to the whole COVID-19 thing, we talk about one of Joe Rogan's recent podcasts, and I got the name of the guest wrong. The proper name of the guest is Dr. Michael Osterholm. He's from the University of Minnesota. That's from a March 10th episode of the Joe Rogan podcast. It's really worth your time after you listen to um, all 56 episodes of mine. When Rory Scovel is not sheltering in place, he tours the country doing stand-up comedy. You can watch his most recent comedy special, Rory Scovel Tries Stand-Up for the First Time on Netflix. Full disclosure, while hilarious, it includes many adult themes, so don't fire it up in front of your eight-year-old's Cub Scout troop. Not that they're getting together in person these days anyway. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you're having a great day, and I hope you enjoy my conversation with Rory Scovel. I remember early on in 2004 when I first moved to D.C. to start doing stand-up. That was the first time I started paying attention to the news because none of it ever mattered to me. I was a college kid. I didn't. <laughs> right. When I voted in the first... My first election that I, I could vote, I voted for, for George Bush because my family was voting for George Bush. And so I voted for George Bush. And I couldn't have told you one thing about George Bush. And I couldn't have told you one thing about Al Gore. And I couldn't have told you one thing going on in the world that was important. And when I moved to D.C. in 2004, now we had our terror chart and it was a time of a lot of people talking about human rights and civil rights. And I think moving to D.C. and actually being in a culture of people, I realized I had no information to ever have the opinion I had. And I think I got angry because that opinion that was put there in my mind influenced what I said and how I said it for so long by people that I thought were an authoritative voice that I could trust. and. I became angry at myself that I, I didn't see that sooner. My name is Paul Ollinger. I'm a stand-up comedian with a background in the corporate world. I hit the lottery when I worked at a small company called Facebook. I'm fascinated with money, why we're so obsessed with it, and how it makes us happy or not. Welcome to Crazy Money. Rory Scovel, welcome to Crazy Money. Yeah, thank you for having me. Hey, listen, I don't want to make you feel bad. I was trying to get Anthony Fauci... But that would make me feel fantastic. I'd be like, let me just listen in. The <laughs> second most vocal guy on social media about coronavirus, Rory Scovel. <laughs> What's going on in your world this week? The same thing as last week, and I assume the same thing as the next. Yeah, just getting messages from people and, and information from people and trying to assume that having roughly you know, 50,000 followers on Instagram, maybe there's some sort of a spread that can happen of information on its own. But it's it's a tightrope that you walk of not wanting to, you know, stir up panic or fear, but try to give out some sort of information that people kind of start to take it seriously. So I've done your introduction in a separate recording, but you're an actor, writer, comedian. You've been on the road. You've been very busy this year. And all of a sudden, things come to a stop. How did you decide to shut it down? When did it become clear to you that this was a real deal? 
Thursday, March 12th, driving from Portland to Boise while on tour with uh, comedian Nick Youssef. He was like, you know, Joe Rogan did a uh, episode with this CDC guy from Minneapolis. And apparently it's kind of been labeled as, you know, just the facts. There's no <laughs> political approach. So we listened to it. And I think we live in a time where being able to read people's voice and who you think they might be is I think it's valuable. I think sometimes you just got to read how people's talk and what they're saying and try to sift through the BS as much as we can. And that podcast for two hours or whatever it was while we were driving was when I turned to Nick and I said, I don't know if we need to go to Boise. I, I think this is more serious than we've ever been told as of yet. And I think we need to drive home. Did you turn around right then? We were close to Boise and we said, let's get to Boise. Let's get a hotel room. And either drive home tomorrow or fly home, which I don't think was a safe decision. Can't look back on it now. Driving would have definitely been safer, but we returned the rental car the next day and hopped on the first flight I could buy. I mean, I, I bought a flight, I think at 11 o'clock that was going to be boarding in one hour. And we bolted to the airport, returned the rental car and hopped on a plane and got back. Yeah, that was, uh, I listened to that. Yeah, I have found some of his guests to be incredibly inspiring and mind opening. And Michael Oberhaus, is that his name? What was his name? I don't know it offhand, but that's very, I think that's close. Yeah, Yeah, he's like an epidemiologist or researcher at the University of Minnesota. And he's not political about microbes. They don't have an agenda. (laughs) Yeah, they aren't red or blue. Well, I guess they could be. (laughs) But they're not uh, politically red or blue. That's right. (laughs) So you do this, you fly home, and for almost two full weeks now, you've been on lockdown. What's your daily routine been? This does feel strange to say because this is a a very tough time for a lot of people, but I'm, I'm on the road and gone quite a bit. So to actually be home and, and actually be with my kid and actually spend time with my wife and actually do things around the house that I wanted to fix or clean or change or rearrange or whatever. I'm doing that very slowly under the assumption that it's going to be a long (laughs) wait. I'm now going, all right, we will around 2 PM every day, my wife and daughter and I put all the electronics away and we, together we watch one episode of the great British baking show. We end up talking about it during dinner I say all this, just to be clear, I say all this as someone who is in a fortunate position of having a very crazy job and at times was given an opportunity to make a good amount of money to save. So my admiration and and respect goes out to a lot of people who are struggling in very different ways that I definitely understand completely. So I don't, I don't want to say, Hey, yeah, we, we all hop on the couch and we watch a TV show and you go, Oh, that's great. There's people suffering and dying. And there there's other people out there still doing work. I'm very much aware of that, but that has become our routine and it's become our routine in order to try to create a distraction with mainly our child and a little bit of sanity for me and my wife. And also that eye opening realization that what we thought was necessary in our lives to entertain ourselves has never actually truly been the case. Being home and being with family, I'm learning is actually quite pleasing. So strange to say, knowing that everyone's in a different position. And and there's never been a better time to have a warm, safe home to be in, especially with if you've got a little bit of square footage that you don't have to be sitting on top of each other all day. I feel empathy for people who have, you know, 400 square feet and six people without, living in that room right now. Without a doubt. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, we're fortunate to have a little home gym. And so I've been able to get my exercise on the treadmill and be like, thank God we have this. It's amazing. I mean, I'd take yeah. online Zumba classes at this point. Oh yes. Easily. And thank God for, you know, these sort of these streaming things. I mean, even look at the opportunity to do this show, you know, and what access we have to certain electronics. I mean, that when we're speaking about gratitude, I mean, that's one right there. Streaming services are like, Oh, that is, yeah, that is a great distraction. <laughs> Sounds like you're able to stay mindful and sort of appreciative of the opportunities that you do have right now. Have you been able to work on things for the longer term besides just replacing light bulbs around the house that need to get fixed? Not entirely. I have seen some people, you know, that are doing some online stand up stuff and trying to figure out how to do how to, I guess, sort of maintain what 
they were doing and how to raise money for either charities or themselves. You know, there's a Mm -hmm. lot of live entertainers that are now out of work. And I don't know what that new stimulus relief bill that was passed last night. I don't know if, you know, at one point I was told that didn't really include a lot of people in the entertainment industry. And I don't know if that was ever adjusted. So now people are trying to figure out how to do live shows. I would say for me personally, I'm not a comedian who got up every single night of the week. I never enjoyed, not that I wouldn't enjoy it, but my process was never the need to get up and do 10 to 20 minutes every single night. I'm not against that. I think that can turn you into a absolute Jedi comedian, uh, the repetition. (laughs) I think repetition in any line of work, you know, you just, you're 10,000 hours. (laughs) Sure. You just, you hit that point, but I've never been like that. So I am currently not craving the need to perform live comedy. I'm sure that day will come, but right now I think the state of affairs with the with the planet and medical stuff, I'm too distracted to be able to really miss it. And I didn't grow up in a family that had much money, so I'm kind of grateful for that because that really did teach me that the money that we have made as a family, we have stored it away, hoping it will still <laughs> be there if uh, who, knows, who knows what lies ahead. But We've stored it away to where at this juncture, I don't have to worry about where we're going to get a next paycheck. We can kind of focus on other things and distract at this point. Right. Let's go back to your family. You were one of seven kids. So that yeah. explains your desperate need for attention that led you to this career. Beyond, beyond. <laughs> yeah, it is definitely the foundation. <laughs> I'm, I'm number five of six. And I, I think yeah. <laughs> on some level, this is me saying, mom. Pay attention to me. <laughs> yeah. is isn't even just the fact that I'm one of seven kids. My dad was one of five kids. So right, you even right. get outside extended family was You're- also pretty massive. And everyone had a pretty smart ass sense of humor. And I learned pretty quickly that was, you know, you could get attention. If you could get people laughing, you might get a little attention. What was the dinner table like at your house? You know, that's what's interesting. At my house, it was like the food's ready. You kind of grabbed it and there were three chairs, maybe four chairs at the counter that you could sit at. We had a little tiny TV on the counter. Every time I think of it, I think of that scene in Back to the Future when he rolls the TV in. He's like, now we can watch Jackie Gleason while we eat. I feel like (laughs) that was us. We're like, yeah, we can watch TV and no one can talk and connect. We never sat around a, a dinner table, which, uh, as I've matured and grown up, I realized the real benefit of the communal aspect of, of sitting around having a meal together all the way back to, you know, when we were cave people. I'm sure that was like, ah, sit around the fire and right. enjoy this and be around each other. So we don't. So today, me, my wife and daughter, we definitely sit around the dinner table. Back then, it was like, grab the food, right. get to your Survival. corner. And if you want seconds, you better be Johnny on the spot. Were your parents working nine to five jobs? My dad worked at and retired, I think, two years ago, two or three years ago, maybe, the uh, post office. He was sorted mail at the post office, nine to five. I mean, he would work overtime. He also officiated uh, high school basketball games when he wasn't, you know, at the post office, like at night on Friday, well, Friday nights mostly. And then my stepmother, she wasn't working at the time just because, you know, there's, there were five younger kids after me and my wow. older sister. So <laughs> <Wow. laughs> you know, it wasn't really much time to get, get to the office. <laughs> what kind of a student were you in school? Horrific, really bad. I thought for a while, I was definitely a class clown for sure. I can vividly remember just being what I now know is just an annoying, <laughs> just piece of shit. There's no way I was, I, I was so intolerable. There's no way I wasn't. Were you ADHD but, uh, or dyslexic? Yeah. So ADHD diagnosed in uh, 10th grade. Just in uh, time. Just when it really (laughs) kicked in, when it really became something. They put me on Ritalin and it kind of affected my appetite. And then they switched me over to Adderall. And I don't know if that's kind of, so this would have been around 96, 97. I don't know if that's when Adderall really started to, you know, that's the first time it came into my periphery. I took Adderall and became an incredible student, Uh, (laughs) got my homework done and then sat in my room and allowed my mind to still wander to the most depressing places. So when I went to college, I myself took myself 
I said, I'm not going to do college on Adderall. I'm going to get rid of that and do it. Do it on it. weed, so, like normal college students. Like a I'm, normal person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm choosing my drugs, mom and dad. Yeah. I was bad. I was bad. school. If there was a subject I liked, I got an A+. Plus. If I didn't like it, I failed it. I didn't, or I got, you know, the minimum to pass. Yeah, I used to think I was dumb. I re- truly thought, oh, I'm dumb. I'm not good at school because you're dumb. And you would kind of see that in TV shows and movies. No one was ever like, oh, these are just people who don't apply themselves. You know, right. for the sake of storytelling and entertainment, it's that they're dumb. And they're always cast in this weird, like, sort of dumb light. And I was like, oh, I'm just, I'm in that group, but I'm not a troublemaker. <laughs> I'm a class clown and I'm dumb. And then I think when I got to college, I was like, oh, I'm not dumb. I just don't apply myself to anything I'm not interested in at all. And unfortunately, that's most of school. <laughs> what was in the wheelhouse and what wasn't? I often think about anything art, anything art was all in and loved it. So I was a communications major in college for journalism. And I think back to this one class I had in college, it was human communication. And it couldn't be more fitting for my, for my career now, the right. fact that I took this class. But I took that class and I was so fascinated by human communication that I didn't look at any of the classwork or the homework as work at all. It truly felt like a joyous, good sensation to be learning it and writing it out and taking tests on it. And I, I got an A plus on every test that when it came to the final exam, the professor didn't, she told me to not come in. She goes, it doesn't make any sense. She's like, you've aced the class. You don't need to take she, what goes, she you, was what like, you, just what, go away. <laughs> do you study like body language and intonation or nonverbal it's communication? A, what is it? It's all of that. It's every single thing. And it's broken down. It was at the time. I wish to God I, I had I had saved a textbook and not you know turned it back in for the money or whatever we used to do. I kind of don't remember. <laughs> right, right. I wish I would have held on to yeah. every everything I ever got from that class to continually just study and read it. But it would be everything. It would be your assumption of who you think might be together in a group just because they're standing close together and how you should appropriately address a group of people and learning how to distract from your own assumptions of who anyone is and who you're speaking with and what someone is telling you based on how they say it. Like we were just saying a little bit ago on reading people a little bit on like on reading people, but stuff that it was so basic that I thought it was so, I, I don't know what it was. I don't know why I attached to it. It had never been something in my periphery before that interested me. I took the class because you had to. And right away, I was like, love it. Love everything we're talking about. Love what we're doing. Does that kind of stuff help you read a room when you're working? I think it can. I think it can help in terms of seeing how people react to something that I might say, but I think now, and I think you, I think any stand-up comics know what I'm talking about, that now it's this sort of nonverbal vibe and this energy that I think we've always been able to read in situations. And it's when you can feel that a room feels joyous or when it's a moment feels awkward. But I think we as comedians can actually feel this sort of communication, nonverbal communication in the crowd of energy and vibes, just because we've done it for so long and because we're not paying attention to trying to read those vibes and energy Mm -hmm. that we actually just can sense like an area of the room that maybe is a little bit (laughs) harder to tap into or when the room is feeling really good or down or whatever. (laughs) Those guys hate me over there. I can tell. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Or like when a check drop comes at a show, oh, right, yeah. sometimes you don't visually see that a check has been dropped, but I can tell the yeah. moment I say a joke and you go, oh, the checks are dropping because why did I suddenly feel that shift? Why did I feel that the room just go away yeah. when I felt them the whole time? They don't turn against you, do they? They just disappear. They disappear and you, you don't even, you're not even looking at it. You just feel it and you go, oh, this entire room has been giving themselves to me and I've felt that and Mm -hmm. now they're not and I'm feeling that and I'm not seeing it or it's not being spoken. You just feel it and then you visually start to notice it. Did you have a performance inclination in college or in high school? 
I think so. Yeah. How'd that come I, out? I don't know that I ever thought that I would be a performer, but I think that's kind of what drove my being a class clown. I think I needed that attention. And I think I liked when people did laugh at something I was acting out or saying or doing, I really loved it. It was such a high. I loved that attention so much. And there was one time in the, I think it was in the 10th grade, the drama teacher needed at the last minute, she needed someone to play the butler in uh, the, the play. And she just said, Hey, I think that you would enjoy this and you'd be good at it. And we have rehearsal today. And then the play is like next Thursday, Friday, I don't remember what it was, but it was coming up, but plenty of time to fill this role. I think someone had gotten sick or something. I don't know what it was. And I called my dad and because my grades are bad, he was like, no, you're not being in the play. You're coming home and you're doing your homework and you're going to do schoolwork. And I don't think I realized it until she said, I think you'd be good at being in this play. I don't think I realized how much maybe I wanted to be doing something like that. I didn't seek it out after that. Were you in the play? Did you play? I was not in the play. Oh my God. I wasn't allowed. My dad wouldn't let me do it because uh, my grades were bad. I'm glad you didn't pull a dead poet society and end up on the floor (laughs) of his study. (laughs) All just to be the butler with one line. That's right. Not even, no one even remembers anyways. Like, oh, we actually cut the butler out of the whole play anyways. That's right. It was such a needless role. I don't remember a butler in Midsummer's Night's Dream. Uh, (laughs) Just appearing for no reason. So when did you, so like, when did it, when did it dawn? Because I remember being in high school and being in plays and having a few lines. And even I was terrible. I sang four songs in Guys and Dolls as the lead role. And they were awful. They were terrible. I was, I'm the worst singer. And even with the pained expressions on the people's faces in the crowd, I was like, I think I'm, this is, I'm good at this. Yeah, like, like, it's fun. And, and it feels good. But I was, I well, also remember thinking, but stage. I could, there's no way to make a living at this. That's just complete silliness. Ever since I was five years old, I can kind of remember this. It was uh, seeing Back to the Future. And sometime after that, watching the movie Rad obsessive, obsessively, as we all did and wanted to be a, a BMX biker right. and type, tie a handkerchief just under our knee over our jeans for no reason. I remember going out into the side street of my house and acting out some of the scenes and really being like, I want to be in that thing. Not thinking, oh, I want to be a filmmaker or an actor. I remember wanting to be in that setting and feel that that moment that I, I had watched in a movie. So I think in middle school, I was in a play. We did Wizard of Oz in eighth grade. And I played the mayor of Munchkinville, Munchkin Town, whatever it was. And I played one of the flying monkeys. And I loved it. I went above and beyond acting out the whole thing, getting super into it. And I think I just thought of that as this one moment in time. I don't think I thought of that as like a thing. It wasn't enough for me to then go, I'm going to be an actor. And I don't think I realized that maybe I would maybe want to try to be an actor or anything until, you know, not getting to do that play in high school and then going on to college and playing soccer and having no interest in acting, but having this huge interest in wanting to be a filmmaker and learn film. And I, I wanted to be a director and I wanted to write stuff. And then when I graduated college, I realized that I didn't know how to do any of that. And I had no experience even stepping towards that at all i so i (laughs) i sometimes laugh that i ended up in the place that i kind of wanted to get to by not directly trying to get to it how did it happen that you found your way into it through stand-up ultimately getting into stand-up after college because i heard a david cross album and i wasn't doing a job i loved i was doing a job that i had buried into my i was a studio camera operator for local news in uh, Greenville, South Carolina, WSPA channel seven. And I love that. Was, that was a fun job. I worked with very fun people, but a part of me was like, Oh, I'll get good at this. And true. No joke. My thought was I'll shoot segments, story segments for like Dateline or something. One day I'll get really good at this. And that's what I'll do. I'll do like, I'll go to the next step of news or whatever. And then I heard that album And it kind of reminded me that I really loved performing. And I thought, 
I liked David Cross's style and I was like, oh, he seems to be having fun and it's very loose. And it seems like the people that go to his shows, that seems like the kind of people that I am and I would like to entertain. And so then I just, I tried it after that and trying it one time, I was like, my best investment in myself is to go this direction, however hard I got to go, because I, I think I understand it and I think I can figure it out. Yeah. Did you just ape David Cross for your first few years on stage? Yes, easily. <laughs> I, I definitely did that first year. I can't remember when I started to like get away from it, but I know without a doubt the first year for sure. I think I have a good guess of maybe when I stopped. So I started stand up in March of 2004. And I then went on the road to do this tour in Canada in the fall of 2006. And I kind of remember how I was performing then that I think by then it had started to fade. If not, that tour, it faded after that for sure. But yeah, I, I, I tell people I looked like David Cross doing an impression of me with my jokes. That's what I looked like. <laughs> right. Just tell yourself that. Yeah. Bobby Slayton came <laughs> yeah. up to me early on and said, uh, besides Dennis Miller, who else or do, do you want to be? And I was like... <laughs> I was like, oh, I think you're telling me to write my own jokes. I think that's <laughs> so that's pretty early to get some road work as a comic. How long did it take until you sort of saw an economic path to supporting yourself as a creative person? That's when I quit my full time job right before that tour because I was going to be gone for a month, month and a half. And so at the time, I was working for the uh, a government contracting firm for the Department of Defense. It was like Veterans Health Affairs. I was just a secretary. So the, all of that information makes it sound like I was really <laughs> under, doing more than I was. <laughs> under secretary for the Southeast area. Yeah. Uh, I was working for the DOD uh, <laughs> secretary for a group that was working for the DOD. Yes. But yeah, that, I quit my job because I wasn't going to be able to come back to it. So the fall of 2006 was the beginning of me making a little bit of money while working numerous part-time jobs. And then I would say maybe those part-time jobs stopped in... 2009, 2010, I was able to rely just on stand up. I think around that time, definitely when we moved to LA. Seven years in. Um, seven years in, yeah. 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 Yeah, that was when I was starting to get more, more road stuff. I could get enough feature spots and people were starting to let me headline for a couple of years. So that money was, was obviously a little bit better. It wasn't great, but it was enough to like, <laughs> no, it's not. you know, it was better than featuring uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. at the time. You yeah. Know? Yeah. No, I, I've told my wife, you know, Hey, look, I'm only losing, you know, 300 bucks this weekend. This is exactly this that's is a exactly. huge weekend. I'm featuring yeah. on the road and I'm only losing a few hundred bucks. Airfare, hotel, the food, you come back, you're like, oh, that paycheck was nothing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I could I could probably net profitable if I wanted to drive 18 hours each way, but yes. I think you'd rather yes. have me home here and eat the cost. I was doing my research. You and I have not hung out before. So all I know of you is what I see of you on TV. I hope I can say this without doing you a huge disservice, but like it's super smart, but it's also super silly all at the same time, but you're not an over the top person. How did you come to your persona on stage? I wonder it as, as well, because I think you, maybe you're similar to me in the fact that I don't know where any of these jokes come from. And I still don't know what particularly inspires them. So I don't ever know why, like, there are some jokes I have where I go, oh, I think that's smart. And while that can be conceited, I think every comic, <laughs> I think every comic can go, oh, I know when I have a killer joke and I know when I have a smart joke and, or when you, something that feels like a smart joke until someone tells you it's not smart. I think I just found that space by loving and respecting what Bill Hicks was doing in terms of I can't sit here and say I'm the biggest fan. I'm not. I don't often go to his stuff to listen to it. But when I do, I love that he's saying what he believes with every ounce of himself that he has. I love the passion and I love the tenacity. And I love that he doesn't care that a lot of people in the audience might be sitting there going, whoa, this guy is losing it right now. <laughs> I love that he's like that. 
and just so sure of himself. And I also love that a lot of what he's saying is trying to speak up for the less fortunate or speak up for a certain group of people that he has compassion for. And sure, there's maybe some people that would disagree with that, but that's how I interpreted it. And so early on in my stand-up career, that was an influence on me that I, I felt that I agreed with him. I agreed with where he was coming from with a lot of his stuff. And then the other side of me loves how silly Steve Martin is. And I love that there's not an ounce of, we're not going to talk about one thing that's serious or real or something you're going to approach or feel or relate to outside of this room. And I think that's why he is a a genius. And I think that's why his standup was absolutely genius. And I think, I think somewhere at some point, and I don't know when, I think I just thought, well, I think I like the middle ground of those two people. I think I don't want to be someone who is aggressively preaching and potentially turning off people who even agree with you (laughs) because preaching, even if they agree with you, people don't want to be preached to. And then I thought, well, I, I want to make sure I don't go over that line. And then I want to be super silly, but I don't want to be so silly that I, I don't say stuff I really think about real stuff because that is what I think about a lot and it does eat away at me. I remember early on in 2004 when I first moved to DC to start doing stand up. That was the first time I started paying attention to the news because none of it ever mattered to me. I was a college kid. I didn't, <laughs> when I voted in the first, my first election that I, I could vote, I voted for for George Bush because my family was voting for George Bush. And so I voted for George Bush and I couldn't have told you one thing about George Bush. And I couldn't have told you one thing about Al Gore. And I couldn't have told you one thing going on in the world that was important. And uh, when I moved to DC in 2004, you know, now we had our terror chart, you know, the Amber alerts, the whatever the chart was. And, and it was a time of a lot of people talking about human rights and civil rights for the LGBTQ community. And I grew up Catholic. And I think it was the first time in my life that I looked back and I went, oh, my whole life, I've just said, no, being gay is wrong and it's sinful and, and you go to hell. And I think moving to DC and actually being in a culture of people, I realized I had no information to ever have the opinion I had. And I think I got angry because that opinion that was put there in my mind influenced what I said and how I said it for so long by people that I thought were an authoritative voice that I could trust. And I became angry at myself that I, I didn't see that sooner. Mm-hmm. And I, it, it really bothered me that it took me till I was 24. And it, it wasn't like I was running around saying anything discriminatory. And it wasn't like I didn't have uh, friends, you know, who were gay or, you know, I, it, it wasn't like I would see someone go, hey, stay away from me. Sure. But I was a person who was like, oh, I don't know. I was taught that it's wrong. And maybe I was slowly fading away from that. But when I got to DC, that became a big part of the first stand up stuff I was writing. It was about George Bush and some of the hypocrisy of religious people and how they were discriminating against that community. And it really bothered me. And for some reason, it, it jokes came out of it. I, I My closing joke for so long was uh, holding up that terror chart. And then turning it sideways to reveal that it's more of a rainbow flag Mm -hmm. and just going, I think we know who they think the real problem is. (laughs) And it was like, I just remember thinking to myself like, oh, this is, this is kind of a smart thing I noticed and a smart little punchline that I have. And it falls in between, you know, that, that this is what I was thinking about at the time, but I look back and I go, oh, it, it falls into saying something serious, but keeping it silly, not being overly preachy about it. I think there's a line. I think there's a line to walk. And sometimes there's a show where it's really fun to vent and rant and let it all out and then try to recover because it's very therapeutic. So I don't completely dismiss the idea of ranting and venting. You can hold that in reserve for when you need it. One of the things we talk about on the show is just sort of awareness and mindfulness about the things that we've been able to accomplish and giving ourselves credit for that. If 10 years ago I had a conversation with you and said, what would you like to accomplish over the next 10 years? And then I showed you what you actually accomplished. 
what would you think of your decades worth of work in that time space? I think I'd be pretty satisfied. I think I'd be happy. I mean, I wanted to, I I've always wanted to be in a movie. And so that's, that happened. I think I'd be surprised. And you weren't just like dude number three in the stand for the record. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I always want to be in a movie and getting to be in Dimitri Martin. I've been in three. So Dimitri Martin's Dean, it doesn't surprise me at all that a comedian cast me. I feel like a lot of the stuff I've done is because a comedian looked out for me or helped me out or put my name in a hat that I didn't even know existed to recommend me for something. I got to do that movie and that was, I was giddy. I was so giddy. The fact that I was in uh, something I thought was a really cool indie film that Dimitri Martin was like making and he was the boss and it was, it was a learning experience all while doing it. I wouldn't even have thought that would have happened, but you know, then getting to do the the house and getting to do Amy's uh, movie, I feel pretty. I think I'd be really happy that I had those experiences. And I think I'd be shocked at the amount of, TV, just small roles on different TV shows for even just a blip. I'd be shocked that I got to do that much. I've made a season of a TV show for Comedy Central that we we don't know if anyone will ever see it or if Comedy Central will air it or if we're going to sell it to a streaming service. It's currently I in it's- limbo, but even that, even that, I wanted to one day make a season of a TV show, but I'm still shocked I actually got to do that. I hope it's about a team of medical researchers at the Stanford Biology Lab. Those are getting greenlit right now, by the way. Those are in. Yeah, those are in. What do you have in the in the uh, pandemic genre, Rory? Anything? So that question answered, how do you, do you find yourself angsty about where you are and what you want to try to accomplish? There's a lot of wantingness in the entertainment business, and I'm certainly guilty of it from where I sit in my home in Atlanta, but you live in Los Angeles, the capital of wantingness in all of history. <laughs> Can you see yourself amidst all that and feel grateful for what you've accomplished and experience joy as you have succeeded in things, but are also trying to continue to move forward creatively? I think that is a fantastic question because I think learning how to answer your question for every person out there who works in art and entertainment, it is essential that you start to narrow down and realize what it is you want to get out of the thing that you love doing and are doing. Because I think a lot of us, you know, you think, oh, you're a comic or you're an actor. Immediately, it's like, oh, you want to be rich and famous. And I think that's maybe in our minds that, oh, I'm on a trek to be rich and famous. Even if you're not successful, your brain is like, oh, I signed up for a job that the goal is to be rich and famous. You want as many people to know about you because that's how you make your money. And by default, that's what makes you both of those things at the same time. And 99% and I, of us will end up poor and unknown. Exactly. Exactly. And I think you can truly shatter yourself if you maintain this. For me personally, I have come to realize that I don't necessarily have any interest in fame. And I would like a lot of money the way everyone would like money. But I I don't know that I've ever seen a mansion that didn't give me anxiety about how much money goes into maintaining oh, it. Dude. <laughs> I don't think I've ever been to someone's house that's really big and not thought about the cost of filling each room with furniture that maybe is never used. And I don't know if that's in me because of the family I grew up in in these financial circumstances. I'm not saying that I don't still want luxurious things and it's not like I don't want luxurious experiences, but I think what I've learned is figuring out what fulfills me creatively. And I think right now I enjoy what I'm, I think my biggest and most fun paycheck comes from that moment of whatever that thing is on stage that I don't know what it is, but it re-energizes my whole system in my body that I could never buy. I could never, there isn't a, a, there isn't a compliment from the biggest person that could give me the same thing that those moments 
that give us. It's like the healthiest dose of whatever that medicine is. You know, people saying <laughs> laughter is the best medicine. I think there's maybe a little bit better medicine coming from the person providing the laughter if it really works, if the connection is really, it's really there. All of this is newer insight for me. I think after doing I Feel Pretty, Amy's movie, I really kind of, you know, that's the first time I was on a, like, you know, this movie set where, oh, I'm spending time with this person who is undoubtedly very successful and works very hard. And it's not surprising at all that she's rich and famous. It's almost what you'd expect just from how her personality pops. And I saw how she had to handle that fame particularly. And I don't know that I was attracted to having to deal with the negativity that comes with everybody knowing who you are and everybody hearing what you say. She has done it in a remarkable way. She has not given two shits about the criticism, at least publicly. But I, I don't know that I don't know that that lifestyle wouldn't break me in half. Yeah. And I think I realized I don't really I don't like going out to dinner and having anyone there recognize me at all. I don't look for, I don't look for that. I don't want that. I want to be a person as we all are sort of anonymous in this world as just a person having experiences. I think there are people that want to walk into a room and everyone spot them and love them and see them. I hate that attention. Yeah. I don't know that I even like compliments after a show. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I only, when I walk into a room, I only want the pretty people to know who I am. That's all I want. That's what I was trying to get at. Um, no, <laughs> I uglies, don't want you know what I mean? <laughs> average, come on. <laughs> I find myself sometimes I'm, I'm like on Facebook and somebody will like something that I, I find to be profoundly clever that I've shared. And I'm like, that wasn't for you. That was for people who've given a Ted talk. <laughs> You've never given a Ted talk. I want to be recognized by people who are yeah, more successful than I am. I'm not, I'm not going to follow you back <laughs> online. Come on. I don't know if I answered that question, but no, I, I, think I, I think for me, I've, Doing the improv shows that I've been doing yeah. has exploded my mind into being like, oh, maybe I, maybe my focus needs to just be, can I make you know the money I want to make? And like I said, let's be honest, everybody wants to make a lot of money because there's there is a, it's true that you can't buy happiness, you can buy convenience that could potentially lead to happier moments and maybe more of them if you don't have this anxiety or stress. Yeah. to worry about financially. Can you, or have you been able to this point, been able to keep yourself from going, yeah, I just sold out a 400 seat room, but man, wouldn't it be great to sell out an 800 seat room or a 1600 seat room? Like, can you catch yourself if your brain starts to work like that? I've told people that if you told me I could go play a sold out Madison square garden you know, tomorrow night, there's no way I, I don't think that will ever happen in my life ever. If you told me I could go do it, I would want to know what that feels like and what it looks like and how hard that is. Mm -hmm. But, and, and again, this, this is an opinion that obviously can't come from experience because I haven't done that and I don't know what that's like. But my assumption is that I just like playing smaller spaces because I can feel that crowd. And for me, being able to feel the crowd is what kind of steers how the show is going and the pace of the show. It isn't so written out. And so even jokes, they can change and absorb and adapt to an audience or a vibe or a space. And I think the size of the space matters to me. I would like to find out what a tour of 500 seat theaters sold out feels like. I'm not there, but yeah, that's my next goal is to go do something like that. Now, if you said I could skip that and I had somehow gotten enough people that I could go do 1500 seat theaters. I have opened for Daniel Tosh in uh, Vegas and it was, I think a 12 or 1500 seat theater. And it was a lot of fun. And it was a lot of his fans that I think by default would, you know, they would like what I was doing, but I was also doing 15 minutes. But while I loved getting those laughs and that wave of laughter from 1500 people is amazingly fulfilling. Nothing I was saying was being steered by the crowd because I could not feel them. It was just one big black mass that you just couldn't see because of the lights. And 
you just kind of said what you wrote and you hope that that works. Yeah. And I don't know that I love that style. I think I, you know, having been in Atlanta at a place like the Earl, you know, sure, there's more money to be made if you go play a 500 seat theater for sure. But the Earl, I can feel every little pocket of people. You know what I mean? Including the guys in the bathroom. Yeah. Yeah. You can just kind of (laughs) feel it all (laughs) because it's all so close. And I, I love it. I've been playing a lot of rock clubs for the past year and a half, two years, something like that. And I've really, really liked it. I like one show and then move on. Yeah. It's kind of fun. Yeah. Your wife, Jordan is, is also a performer. How do you two support each other in your careers? I'm really grateful that she also does this line of work because she gets it. So when I got to be gone a lot, ever since we started dating, I was gone a lot. So she gets it and understands it. Has a boyfriend. Uh, has, she's got someone else when I'm away, <laughs> which we've talked about. It's helpful. Um, it's helpful. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm grateful that she gets it because I think it would be a difficult strain to have to, you know, constantly defend every time I have to leave, but she understands it. So it makes it much easier to go and do the job that, you know, you signed up to do. And, uh, yeah, she auditions and acts in commercials and some TV spots here and there. That's kind of been, if I'm not working regularly or she's not working regularly, that's kind of what we get. Most of our work is little TV spots here and there, some commercials. It's pretty easy to support each other. Like I said, we're fortunate that, our jobs are, are fun. And, you know, it has, we've been able to save a lot of that money so we can, you know, kind of keep our uh, cool heads about ourselves when it comes to our relationship and, and what we stress over. Yeah, that's good. So in doing my research, I was, I was watching some of your old Conan clips and your, your latest Netflix special, Rory Scovel tries stand up for the first time filmed right here (laughs) in Atlanta, Georgia. Relapse theater. I found it interesting that in the in the opening sequence of the special, you made a joke about Zika. (laughs) Yeah. So how does it feel to be responsible for this whole thing? You know what? I I think they said it on that Joe Rogan episode that there's still not necessarily a vaccine for Zika, but it just kind of, I don't know if it went away. I don't know what herd immunity. Is that what happened? I get, I don't know. I don't know what, but someone said that when they were talking about, well, how about a vaccine for COVID? And someone's like, well, this was four years ago and we haven't really developed that. Now, granted, we can all conclude there isn't this huge need for this Zika vaccine. And it also didn't, it isn't what we're currently experiencing. But yeah, I, the only thing I hate about that joke is that it's, uh, it's just, it's got such a shelf life. There's people watch that years from now. They're like, what is Zika? <laughs> A guy sneezed or coughed and they go, Zika? What does that mean? Was that like H1N1? Was that like swine flu? I don't know. Is that like what we're doing now? Still four years from now. Is that still what we're dealing with? What do you think? What's your what's your over under on the number of weeks we'll be on lockdown? I think it's gonna be a very long time. I think the next potential move, and believe me, this is coming from someone who knows I have no background in this. You do have a communications degree from the I, South Carolina I, State's educational system. So. I, I do. And I'm trying to figure out uh, daily if I try to post any information, walking that fine line of not stirring panic and fear, but, you know, information that maybe, uh, as that guy said in Joe Rogan's episode, scare people into their wits. It definitely worked for me. I think testing, as soon as we have adequate testing that's available on a massive level, then after that, it, I, I don't know, but to me, it, that at least gives you some kind of awareness of what you're up against and where maybe it is and what the numbers are. I, I think uh, the reason I just keep posting as much as I can is just to not flood the hospitals, and, which are already flooded, and, it's, and to try to not have people that could potentially... I, I think the likelihood of a lot of people getting it is high, and if we all get it at different times. Those of us that may recover from it, maybe we don't put these healthcare workers at great risk or we don't over flood these hospitals. I know right now, if I need a ventilator, I don't have a lot of faith that there's a ventilator available for me. And so in order to avoid that, I'm 
staying home, hoping I'm not sick and hoping I haven't gotten others sick. Like we said, I've been touring extensively since early January. So today is day 13 that I haven't been around other people. And so we're now locked into the red zone to see, you know, what next week or two looks like for all, all of us, you know, yeah. I don't know how long the lockdown goes, but I do know, and you would know this more. I don't know much about economics, but I do know that an economy can't exist if there's no people to facilitate it. <laughs> That's a pretty uh, basic tenet. <laughs> if there's no demand or supply, there is no market. There, it doesn't there is exist. no nothing uh, yeah, because right. everyone's yeah. gone and now uh, buildings and things that we have made just slowly decay over time and all our plastic will be the only remnant of who we That's once right. were. That's right. For the next, for the next uh, evolution of people or aliens that find our planet. But I don't know. I don't know how long it lasts, but I think telling people Easter is incredibly dangerous. And I think, uh, I, I don't even look at June or July. I, I personally wouldn't put myself or my family in any kind of harm's way until I was certain that they weren't going to be put in a position to, to get ill in some way. And I, I don't know what the solution to that is when it comes to money. And I don't know if that means we have to, on a local level, learn that money is not a natural resource of this planet. It's a system, meaning maybe a new system on different local levels has to be figured out. We all have skill sets. We all have things that we can add to the system in a, you know, serviceable way. I, I don't know. I can easily drift down the dark future road, but it's always just a matter of trying to predict whatever might be next just to be prepared for it. Yeah. Well, I thought Fauci made a good point. The way he phrased it was, you know, the virus doesn't follow the calendar. The calendar follows the virus. Let's see what happens. Let's, we're not, we don't need to make any artificial deadlines because yes. a false early reopening uh, of things will just lead to a rebound in November, which is going to be twice as painful and twice as expensive. So let's take our medicine and do it right this time. And I also want to acknowledge yes. that I'm very, very fortunate. I'm not going to miss any meals in the interim when I say that. But the people who are living on the edge, it's going to be twice as bad on them if we don't fix it this time around. That's my non-medical opinion. I, that's just the way I think. Yeah. And I think what I hope we learn from this is who the true, and I know you see it all posted everywhere, but who the true heroes are of, of our existence and what our needs truly are and who those people are are and what they contribute to society. And right now, I mean, doctors, nurses, healthcare workers, scientists, people that are bring, it's still working at grocery stores, bringing people groceries, providers, people who are, you know, a, as we can all assume, financially not ever, you know, covered for what they, they do. And a lot of them not given an opportunity to one, be able to afford the education, or the opportunity to, to even to have it. I, I hope that this experience, if there's anything to take away from it, is that people reconfigure their gratitude and they reconfigure what is important to them. And they start to understand that maybe instead of convenience, maybe it's more important for you to find out where your bread does come from locally and go support that person who makes that thing that you need Instead of, you know, I, I'm not here to go, hey, I'm against grocery stores. I'm certainly not. I shop at them. But it has made me realize, like, well, if the grocery store suddenly tells me there's no eggs, where do eggs come from? And now you suddenly go, oh, there's all these local farmers <laughs> that I can contact who are like, yeah, we need money. So if you want these eggs, we have eggs. And go, oh, well, how about in a perfect world, I have a relationship with you. Because that's what that's what we have been like so much in, in history. I could ramble on forever. But no, I think, I think, I think <laughs> you're making good points. And I mean, this this is a global ecosystem that's led us to, that's helped facilitate this. And we all have a part in it, all of us. And so, yeah. uh, but hey, I want to say thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Can you offer me- Thank you. Offer our listeners, give me a book, a movie, and your favorites, not your work, obviously, and I know you wouldn't do that, but what are your, what's your favorite stand-up special, what's your favorite book, and what's your favorite movie that people might not have seen that- uh, Love it. They can get through love this time it, with. Love it, love it, love it. There's no wrong answer. Right. I think Nate Bargatze is maybe the best stand-up comedian 
in the country. There's so many who I love and adore who are fantastic, but Nate is just so simple and clean and monotone and zero movement on stage. And it's one of the best shows I've ever seen. Maria Bamford, also a favorite for me personally, inspiring my own act. A book that I hype all the time is Stephen King's 112263. It is a fantastic read. If you want to dig deeper into how we've evolved as people, I recommend the book Sapiens. Very good read. And then the other one was a movie. Yes, book, movie, right? stand-up special. And you've done books and stand-up special. Back to the Future is a favorite of mine always. Have you, uh, have always you, have been. Did you ever work with Tom Wilson? I did. I worked with him on uh, Bo Burnham's Zach Stone is Gonna Be Famous, little one-season MTV show that should have gotten two seasons. We didn't work together every day, but anytime I saw him, I mean, I was... I was so giddy. Tom Wilson, for our listeners, played Biff in Back to the Future. And he's also a comedian that you wouldn't necessarily know that, but he is um, he is a super, super nice guy. and uh, He's fantastic. He's always yeah. a delight to be around. So Back to the Future, what's your other recommendation? Oh, God. I, I'm always like, what have I read? Back to the seen Future 2? Like, floored me. I didn't love Back to the Future 2. <laughs> On a rewatch, it just wasn't there for me. Doesn't hold up. Um, Willow. Classic. I'm going with a lot of classics. Willow is a, is Willow. a uh, I'm going to have to show that to my kids. I think it's time. I think it's time for Willow. How what? old are your kids? Nine and ten. Is that is that old enough? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Princess Bride, maybe? Willow and Princess Bride? Love Princess Bride. Watched it on a, a flight, probably at some point during my touring in january and was as like, you, oh, as yeah, i love this movie as you're infecting all those fellow passengers as i was slowly spreading the thing i'm currently spreading <laughs> information about <laughs> all right i'll put links to these uh i'll list at least put lists of your recommendations in the show notes rory man thank you so much for taking time it was really fun to talk to you yeah thanks for having me this was a lot of fun i appreciate all right. it I hope to see you out there in the clubs in just a few months Oh, God, that would be the the absolute best. Thank you, Rory, so much. That was a lot of fun. It's so cool to talk to somebody that you've watched on stage, you watched on TV, and you're like, this guy's amazing. And then you talk to him, and he's just like a regular subdued guy who's just grateful to be able to do what he's doing. And he's doing it so, so well. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to have some fun and laughter these days, I highly recommend that you Google Rory Scovel on Conan. R-O-R-Y-S-C-O-V-E-L-O-N-C-O-N-A-N, Rory Scovel on Conan. Watch his appearances from oldest to most recent, and you'll just watch this evolution of his hilarious act that I think is only getting started. I think that there's so much more that we're going to see from him over the next decade. It'll be fun to watch. Ladies and gentlemen, if you like what we're doing here on Crazy Money, I sure would appreciate it. If you take just a minute to give me a rating on that there podcast app on which you are listening to this on that, whenever I say that it's such a hard thing with the prepositions, anyway, drop me a nice rating, drop me a nice review. Sure would appreciate it. That's the way other people find out what they might like on these here podcasts. And there's a lot of them. So help me stand out with your rating and endorsement. As always, I am hugely appreciative of your time and interest in what we're doing here at Crazy Money, which couldn't happen without my friend and editor, Mike Carano. Mike, make me sound smart. 